So our presentation today is on the call to knighthood and knighthood in its noblest form uh, remains as important as ever for the evolution and maturation of humanity. It is the symbol par excellence for service and the courage needed thereof. The keynote of knighthood is caring, unconditional caring, known through the mystical experience of the divine within and only applied through the high development of character. So we'll expand on those points today and we'll first have a, uh, a meditation. So I'll let you see an uh, image of Theodore, uh, who's later sanctified in the church. Uh, it's uh, on the exterior of the south transept of Chartres Cathedral, which I know many of you have visited. The Rose Christian Order Amorc is not a, a religion, um, but we'll look at the sculpture in a very, a very mystical way and it's suggestive of uh, the various signs and symbols of a knight. So for our meditation, let's take a moment uh, to contemplate the image of Theodore. And when you're ready, close your eyes. You may wish to take a few deep breaths, neutral in the sense of not holding the inhalation or holding the exhalation. And with the deep breaths, feel the vitality of the cosmic essence or the vital life force. A very enriching tingling in the body. Let go of the cares of the day. After the meditation and the presentation will be regenerated and enriched and be able to handle those challenges, face them, the courage of the night. You may wish to visualize before we begin our ascent to the heights of the celestial sanctum for cosmic attunement small rings of iron, hundreds of them, on your chest, in your back, in your arms, in your lower body, like the male of a knight, the Middle Ages. But this is no ordinary chains, small links. You can feel a great deal of love and well-being radiating from the chain, from those who have worn it in service and love of humanity. Now let us begin our ascent to the heights of the celestial sanctum. See yourself rising out from the room where you are, rising up. up over the city or town where you are, or geographic area, up over the state or the province, even up over the country, rising up to see the beautiful blue jewel of the earth beneath you. Take in the great fiery ball of the sun and the other planets. You may wish to say with me, May the divine essence of the cosmic infuse my being and cleanse me of all impurities of mind and body that I may enter the celestial sanctum and attune in pureness and in worthiness. So be it in truth, so mote it be. And continue to rise up through the Milky Way galaxy, the great spiraling galaxy, which is our home and exit from the great spiraling arm near our home and rise up past myriad stars, galaxies, nebulae, super clusters of galaxies, move faster and faster and use a great deal of inner strength of the night to rise. We can go faster than the speed of light because we're transcending space and time now. 
but do not be passive now. When we reach the celestial sanctum, we'll be passive. But now use great inner strength. Give it everything you've got within you. Rise up faster and faster. Be inspired by this beautiful view of the cosmos, the great dynamic system and order of the universe. Gradually reach the great cosmic axis of the universe. Stupendous, sense this stupendous harmony and order as the universe revolves about this axis. And as we come to the celestial sanctum, you may wish to use a particular temple or inspiring place in nature or on this special occasion on knighthood, you may wish to envision a knight, a home of the grail, a castle and shrine of the holy grail. Picture it and enter into it now. And as you come into this sacred space, you may wish to visualize the various sights and sounds and the symbols, especially those of the knighthood. And since others of like mind with you are working in service for the enlightenment of humanity. And come forward to a room where there's a tremendous light radiating from it. Come in and see. On an altar there, there's the Holy Grail, the Grail. Take time to see it, be astonished by it, and yet know that something very familiar has been with you always. As you settle there in peace profound, let the grail move into your heart and become one with it. Now, before we begin our descent, let us undertake an act of chivalry with the strength of the grail and the strength of our heart, the God within, the master within, that has radiated love and well-being and understanding to all sentient beings in the universe, all those in need on earth and beyond. Radiate the love and well-being now. Soon we'll begin our descent from the heights of the celestial sanctum, the shrine and castle of the Holy Grail. Thank you for this service, this act of chivalry, the Knights of the Rose Cross. With gratitude and a prayer on our lips, let us begin our descent from the heights of the celestial sanctum, thankful for this opportunity to grow and learn and attune and be of service. Let's travel back past the stupendous harmony and order of the universe, the super clusters of galaxies, nebulae, back to the great spiraling arm of the Milky Way galaxy, which we call our home, and through it back to the solar system and the great fiery ball of the sun to see the beautiful blue jewel of our Earth. As we return there, let's say, May the divine essence of the cosmic 
recognize this attunement. And a God of our hearts sanctify this attunement of self with the celestial sanctum. So be it in truth. In other words, so mote it be. To gradually come back to the earth and the country where you are, the state or province, the city or town or geographic area, and back into the room where you are, the building. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes refreshed, recharged, and ready to learn and fulfill your duties and mission in life. Thank you. In this presentation, we'll consider some of the history and meaning of knighthood and its particular relevance to us as members and students of the Rosicrucian Order and Mark. Knighthood is often thought of as something of the past. But the spirit of knighthood continues in many facets of society today. For example, here you see Joan of Arc, I should say uh, Florence Nightingale, um, working in the Crimea and later helping with the creation of nursing in the modern form. And with it, you see the Royal Red Cross, which is an order of knighthood. Created at, during the time of Queen Victoria, and uh, an early recipient was Florence Nightingale. We also notice, for example, the extensive emergency first aid and medical services of St. John Ambulance has back of it one of the old orders of knighthood, the Knights Hospitallers, or the Knights of the Order of the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem. Another example is the humanitarian and service oriented laws and practice of scouting and guides. They are largely based on the tradition of codes of knighthood, as its founder, Lord Baden Powell, tells us. Additionally, many countries recognize various outstanding contributions to the welfare and constructive advancement of their state or the world generally through honorary knightings and related awards. The designation Sir and Dame in Britain and the Order of Canada are such examples. Members and officers of our order have received such recognition. For example, past Imperator Ralph M. Lewis, Chief Executive Officer in the past of our order, was awarded the National Order of the Equatorial Star of the Republic of Gavin on March 7th, 1983 in recognition of the Rosicrucian Order's educational and cultural activities in that African nation. I would like to cite the Imperator's words on that occasion as indicative of the spirit of humanitarianism and knighthood. I quote, I'm deeply moved and honored to receive this award. I accept it on behalf of our many members in Gavin. Each Rosicrucian feels an obligation to assist in the enlightenment of humanity. In Gavin as elsewhere, our members work not just for their own personal advancement, but also to better become better citizens in service to the community." Unquote. We see subtly then that the work of knighthood can take two forms. One is that outwardly readily apparent and may be so recognized, and another that is behind the scenes. Both forms of expression are of value and are of great service today. 
looking back in history among the great expressions of knighthood that shine forth is the personage of Joan of Arc, here depicted from a film from last year. Joan of Arc courageously followed her inner voice to the great upliftment of the entire country of France. She faced a great deal of greed and fear directed toward her and she was burned at the stake. Untouched by the fire, her inspiring example lives on through the centuries. She represents the onward movement to truth and concern for the suffering of others, even in the face of great sacrifice and persecution. A wealth of symbolism and allegory has developed over the centuries associated with knighthood. The sword, shield, breastplate, and helmet have had various symbolic attributes. Here, if you've ever visited Canterbury Cathedral in England, you may have seen the tomb effigy of the Black Prince pass through transition in the year 1376. In terms of the symbolism of the knighthood, you may recall from the book, Behold, Behold the Sign by past imperator Ralph M. Lewis. But he has this section there on the symbolism of armor. <clears throat> In it, he cites a biblical passage, particularly Ephesians 6, 13 to 17 that states, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is an unusual passage in the Bible because its mystical and allegorical sense is readily apparent. This profound work is by the inspired artist, Joel Clark. It's entitled Divine Mind, Source of Royal Will. You know, the association with the rose, the profound tradition of enlightenment that comes down through Egypt, through our tradition. And here we see the night. Indeed, one of the powerful allegories of knighthood is that of St. George slaying the dragon and overcoming and purging of the outer mind and the subconscious mind of fear, superstition, and ignorance. Other prominent symbolism and allegories, are of course, the Knights of the Round Table and the Crest for the Grail. Here we see passed down through time, the esoteric wisdom. It was the, with the Egyptian mystery schools, but also in some of the inner orders of knighthood, such as the Rose Craw that we're associated with. You notice the pyramids here and the divine lines passing down, radiating out, similar to our radiations during our meditation period. This is also associated with how the sovereign was a knight, which we'll elaborate on with another work by Joel Clark. <coughs> this is a work entitled The Path by Reginald Mackle, well-known theosopher. It shows our path through life 
the experiences and lessons in the adventurous castle and rising up, and purging ourselves, polishing the mirror of our soul personality so that we have constant rapport with the master within. We achieve the rose cloth state. These allegories convey the mystic's trials and journey on the path of expanding self-awareness. The night represents one among many approaches to life that can be of value to the student of mysticism. The alchemist, the artist, the healer or the nurse, for example, represent other such valuable approaches. Knighthood, as well as the other approaches, can provide images to help our objective mind understand mystical experiences. It can also provide valuable ideals to which the character can be molded. In this way, the soul personality is assisted in conforming absolutely to the nature of the one soul to express objectively all the inner spiritual qualities. You'll see here the forming of the, the knighting, but it also as a parallel as part of the inspiration, one of the key founders of, of nursing, as I mentioned earlier, Florence Nightingale, the mystic. Here we see the capping ceremony. I know some of you of nurses have gone through a ceremony that can take various forms of pinning or capping and has various parallels with being called to knighthood and service. Now, true knighthood can represent most fundamentally an attitude. Here we see <clears throat> the artistic work by the Russian Ilya Glezunov. It's entitled Prince Igor. The gifts and prowess that one may have physically, emotionally, mentally, psychically, and overall spiritually are applied conscientiously and tirelessly to the, for the welfare and not indifferently or to the detriment of others. The keynote of knighthood is caring, unconditional caring, known through the mystical experience of the divine within and only applied through discernment and high development of character. This is part of the purpose in the Rosicrucian order why character is stressed and why our lessons help, help us in that regard. Now we're tested in that regard. This duty requires fearlessness and courage. Michael Shalhoub has wonderfully talked to us about the recent courage and the bravery in the recent Rosicrucian Symposium. Now these qualities of fearlessness and courage are not suddenly attained or granted by merely wishing them. But they will come forth through the heat of battle. If the student has prepared himself or herself and loyally and systematically following the Rosicrucian Order's instructions and teaching. In this regard, we see on the left here the renowned and traditional Rosicrucian Raymond Lull, one of the inspired figures in our history. He wrote a text entitled The Book of Chivalry. In it, Here's it from an illuminated manuscript, a, de a depiction of a squire that was on his way for a knighting ceremony. And he fell asleep on his horse and the horse wandered into the woods. Now this, it was gonna be late, it would appear, but the inner self knew what was happening and so did the horse. And as they come into a clearing in the, in the forest, they come to a holy hermit who's expecting the squire and he instructed him, uh, the squire, in the order of chivalry, and many of the qualities that we're talking about in this present presentation. Here's another work by the inspired artist, Joel Clark. It's entitled Pharaoh, Pharaoh Symbol of Perfect Being. You see in it the association of the sovereign of the pharaoh with that of the, of the medieval sovereign and knight. 
we have the esoteric tradition suggested by the uh, pyramid and also the great rays of light above. We see the slain of the dragon here, the transmutation of our gross nature, refinement, uh, um, spiritualization of our nature, akin to the alchem alchemical work of going from the dross lead to the spiritualized gold in our nature. Further in this regard, here's a, a picture from June 2nd, 1953, of Queen Elizabeth II. She's wearing St. Edward's crown. She's carrying the scepter and the rod after her coronation in Westminster Abbey. Beside her, she has clergy, the archbishop and bishops. She's in St. Edward's chair. She's at uh, one of the most holy places in the cathedral, and she's also in a, a throne that's associated with cosmic axis. In that ceremony, there's various uses of swords. Here she returns a sword that we placed back on the oral altar. It was part of the psychocosmogram uh, and the uh, psycho psychodrama of the initiation that is coronation. One of those very sacred acts that take place during this service of knighthood and knighting and becoming the uh, queen or sovereign was that the Knights of the Garter, you may recall that the traditional Rosicrucian Elias Ashmole wrote a history of the Knights of the Garter. Here, four Knights of the Garter hold a canopy over Elizabeth II. At this time, the cameras turned away because it was deemed too, too sacred of an act to film on camera. And the Archbishop came forward and anointed her with oil. Underneath where she was uh, is the Cosmati pavement. It's one of the masterpieces of medieval art. If you've been to uh, Westminster Abbey, you may have seen it, particularly in recent years. For many years, it was covered over by carpet, but there's been a great work of restoration. It's a Mandela or a psychocosmic gram, and we know from a Latin inscription on it that it relates to the four elements and the quintessence at the center. The ceremony took place on top of and in the presence of this sacred, sacred diagram. Befittingly, because the whole ceremony and service is like a microcosm, a macrocosm, which this diagram is also. Here we see the queen, Elizabeth II, with various knights of the realm, uh, <clears throat> earls and dukes, archbishop and bishops, so the temporal and spiritual realm, we also see various swords. There was a temporal sword of justice, the spiritual sword of, of justice, the sword of mercy and the sword of state, all an important part of this ceremony of knighthood. Oops. Here, bringing these concepts together before we finish up, we see Joel Clark's inspired work of the Pharaonic being the uh, perfect, perfect being which we're called to and is always within us, symbolized by the sovereign, taking the sovereign in its spiritual inner sense. Here we have Elizabeth II returning one of the swords to the altar after leaving the throne. And we have the great cosmetic pavement, the diagram of the cosmos in a microcosm. Each of these images here in a way is a picture of yourself. You're looking at yourself in each one of these. In a certain sense, this is who you truly are. Each of these represents the great drama that goes on within us and that perfect inner being and strength we have through knighthood.
Here we have a depiction and drawing of the Knight of the Rose Cross. You know, further knighthood is not bound by race or age, gender, sexual orientation or religious heritage. A knight may be of any of these. Indeed, there are knights from many different cultures. Knighthood represents a profoundly meaningful and humble way of life. And it moves a person beyond himself or herself to a larger spiritual movement, spiritual movement for the welfare of humanity and for all beings. This is best expressed by the Rosicrucian sacred obligation of service taken during the first temple initiation, passing of the threshold in, into our order, which is voluntarily taken. It's a very serious one for the rest of our lives. It's done before the sign of the cross to associate with the Rosicrucians in the name of the divine within. And there's a pledge there to do your utmost to be of service and to restore the world to light. Indeed, the Rosicrucian order and Mork is a form of knighthood. This symbolic work of art depicts the noble knight of the Rose Cross, carrying the banner of the order on the path of light. and achievement for the exaltation of the inner person or being. The conqueror of the forces of darkness. He is an important figure. As former Imperator H. Spencer Lewis pointed out, for Amwork is a militant organization with a militant background and a militant organization back of it. He is here for the purpose of revealing and not of concealing and of actively aiding in the evolution of the human being, rather than passively enjoying the fruits of that which has already filled the pages of history. The ancient Rosicrucians were always pictured as knights in armor, with hands upon an unsheathed sword ready to unsheath it, draw it and use it in defense of the banner flying over their heads in a defense of the principles by which the human is freed from superstitious, ignorant, and enslaving conditions that surround us. Such a knight may be slow in drawing her sword, but when she does, she does so, the world finds it is unstained sword, brilliant in its silver pureness, magnetic and fiery, electrical and protective. In all the battles waged against the Rosicrucians in the past centuries, there's never been any retrenchment, but always a victory for the Knights of the Rose Cross. And the same glorious record will be maintained in the future. This is the organization devoted wo woefully to freedom of the enslaved human. It is neither political, religious, religious or, nor social. It is not the toy of persons of wealth nor the tool of persons of power, but the friend and companion of the humble human being. And as such, it will continue to exist and live as long as human consciousness requires its services and guidance. We experience this knighthood in various ritual initiations of the order, including the knightings in the installation ceremonies of the Grand Lodge and Supreme Grand Lodge officers. Some of you, I think, witnessed this. This is past Grand Master Christy E. Knudsen, being knighted by past Imperator Christian Bernard with ritualistic conductor Dennis Kwiatkowski on July 25, 1991, at the Amorth English International Convention in Houston, Texas. You may recall this image too from the fall 1991 Rosicrucian Digest. Further, the Rosicrucian code of life 
and the creed for happiness are both profoundly permeated with the spirit of knighthood. Later, we'll post in the group chat some references where you can access the creed for the Rosicrucian Creed for Happiness and the Rosicrucian Code of Life. So I know many of you are thoroughly familiar with these already. From the creed for happiness, for example, it says, I shall forgive freely before forgiveness is asked. I shall harbor ill thoughts toward none. I shall remain poised and serene in every trial and face each emergency without fear. I shall be friendly and courteous toward all. To me each day will be one of kindly deeds and unselfish love. I shall obey those in authority and give loyalty to all whom loyalty is due. I shall be clean in body, action and thought. I shall revere my God. As a concluding point on knighthood and the Knights of the Rose Cross, let us consider the 29th and final point of the earlier form of the Rosicrucian Code of Life. Hold sacred and above all criticism the ideals of the Rosicrucians. Permit no slander to affect the good name of your order. Live that life which will prove the goodness of your principles and be ready to defend the emblem of the Rose Cross with the might of your life and the light of your being. So be it in truth or so mode it be.